All right. All right, mm -hmm. I'll shoot. Oh, you want to do something? Okay, I'll shoot. All right, thank you all for having me. It's wonderful to be here. And, you know, usually whenever anyone invites me to do a talk in, on feminist economics or, uh, you know, any of these issues, I uh, usually just cancel everything else I'm doing and hop on. And uh, all, uh, the same goes for attending talks on feminist economics to the extent that I can. Of course, everyone has, you know, everybody is very time poor and has to deal with, a lot of care responsibilities of their own. But despite that, this is something I really like doing. So thank you all for having me. And it's great that you guys have a Rethinking Economics chapter in JNU. Um, you know, that, that's one, I, I wish this had happened when I was in JNU, but you know, plenty of water has sailed under that bridge. Nonetheless, thank you all for having me. And today we're going to do a basic introduction to feminist economics. I have here a very peremptory, uh, you know, I'm not very proud of this timeline, but I managed to put something of a timeline together. This is something I'm still researching on a little bit more. So feminist economics is what? It's basically about a feminist engagement with economics. And feminist economics across the, across the board, whether they're neoclassical, whether they're Marxist, whether they are uh, post-colonial, post-modern, what have you, uh, you know, every school of thought that there is, there are feminist institutionals, there are feminist social economists, there are feminist e economists of, you know, every other kind of uh, political commitment as well. But all feminist eco economists agree that feminism is essentially a political program, including the neoclassical, uh, you know, feminist e economists who use neoclassical methods. They also agree that feminism or feminist economic or feminism is essentially a political program, right? So now, according to Julie Nelson, uh, you know, she, uh, she writes at one point in the 1990s that the feminist train left the station of economics rather late, right? Economics is generally considered to be a pretty conservative area of study. In fact, that's partly one of the reasons why I started studying economics because, you know, patriarchal family, dad said, go study economics. And there I went to study economics. Didn't have much choice in the matter, had no agency, no empowerment. And then I was. So, you know, economics is a very conservative field, essentially. And uh, it's, it's a well-known and well-documented, even well-theorized and well-empirically tested phenomena that women are at a decided disadvantage in the economics profession. It's also very well-known that, uh, you know, identities outside of the cishet identity are at a disadvantage in the economics profession, right? Especially if you want to actually discuss questions of sexuality, it's not something that economics has done very well. So the feminist train left the station of economics rather late. That is definitely true. But by and large, it is understood by everybody who is interested in the subject that feminism is a political program and it's a progressive political program, right? So there is most of feminist interaction with economics is a challenge. You can say a feminist engagement with economics, but it's also a feminist challenge to economics. And feminists have been challenging economics, though, of course, much of this literature is uh, fairly recent up to the 1990s. Feminists were challenging the economics profession and engaging with economic questions as far back as the 19th century. Uh, the work of Charlotte Perkins Gilman is well known. Not all of it is uh, very, uh, you know, uh, not all of it is entirely progressive. That, that is certainly true because she was quite racist. Uh, however, and you know, also she had a difficult life. I won't say that she was entirely, you know, in an aristocratic position, but uh, you know, white woman and slightly racist views as well. 
however this is one of the first well, well known challenges to economics and it goes all the way back to the 19th century and you know feminists even now are challenging all uh, aspects of economic thought from classical political economy to uh, neo classical economics to uh, you know all the way to behavioral economics today so there has always been a challenge to the economics profession so 19th century we'll start with charlotte perkins gilman we won't read her directly but you might have seen her quoted in francis woolley's uh, reading then we will talk about the feminist challenge to the marxist interpretation of capitalism because after all the marxist project and the feminist project uh, took a while to align heidi hartman calls it the unhappy marriage of marxism and feminism right we'll talk about the challenge of black feminist political economy and uh, you know we will you know we will all have different opinions on intersectionalities but you know we need to talk about where intersectionalities come from uh, we'll talk about the the feminist response to gary becker right because throughout the you know feminist movement you also have many uh, you know important social voices coming up in uh, you know talking about the family talking about uh, the gender discriminate division of labor there's faustian weblin in the early 20th century there's karl marx in the 19th century and there is gary becker in in the 1970s where he writes his treaties on marriage and how do feminists respond to gary becker it's well known that becker is not a feminist he had very conservative views he often talked about comparative advantage that women have in housework and you know much of the counter image of feminist economics is the conservative home economics movement so the two sort of go hand in hand and the home economics movement basically comes from you know it's an offshoot of gary becker and then we get to today's discussions which are social reproduction theory right um there are many limitations with my presentation today it's not the best job and because this is something i like doing i try to push myself even more uh but you know from your comments and your critiques i will slowly keep improving this as we go anyway uh so you guys i take it are probably not particularly familiar with uh, charlotte perkins gilman but those of you who like novels have you ever read a novel called the yellow wallpaper no okay it, it, it's a really interesting novel it's a 19th century novel and it's one of the first few times that uh, there is a critique of what domestic confinement you know women's confinement to housework to the domestic sphere what it does to their mental and emotional well-being charlotte perkins gilman was not you know a professional economist in the sense that you know professional economists are professional economists today uh, she did a number of things among the many things she did she also wrote novels she wrote plays and she wrote the yellow wallpaper i've read the uh, i've read the novel i've also watched it performed by a modern dance theater troupe modern feminist dance theater troupe it, it's actually great fun so the story goes that here is a woman who has postpartum depression she's just given birth and uh, you know it, uh, ppd is something that happens to a lot of women after they give birth uh, you know they it's a big change in your lifestyle because you just have to you know take care of the small baby and also because you're breastfeeding because of the toll that it takes on your physical health sometimes you also get confined to the home and you don't get to interact with other people and you know live the kind of life that you did before the child so the same thing happens to the heroine of this novel the yellow wallpaper and uh, the doctor you know this is also one of the beginnings of feminist thought where we start talking about feminist interactions or women's interactions with healthcare so the doctor tells her that you need to stay at home for the sake of your own health and you cannot do any intellectual work or undertake any kind of exertion of that kind 
so she's not allowed to you know write anything in her diary in her uh, you know do any studying per se and she's stuck at home with the baby and she has to you know live in this room with only a yellow wallpaper and the novel basically documents how uh, this woman starts suffering from anxiety and paranoia and uh, issues of mental health where she starts imagining uh, you know people crawling out of the yellow wallpaper and she starts talking to her wallpaper and becomes obsessed with it so this idea of the domestic sphere of women being confined there which is also a very big highlight of feminist economics work today as being detrimental to women's mental and emotional health this goes back to the 19th century another of charlotte perkins gilman's work which is not just her literary work but also her economics work is a book that she calls women and economics and uh, you know the kind of ideas that she discusses in women and economics those ideas predate the writing of gary becker when becker won the nobel prize it was understood that you know it's because he has taken economics to many places where economics has not gone before mm. such as marriage you know how do you start developing an economic theory of an otherwise social institution of marriage right how do you think about marriage from an economic angle perkins Gil gilman was already talking about marriage in the 19th century as a market and this is a quote from her book she, women and economics she says he is the market the demand she is the supply and with the best intentions the mother serves her child's economic advantage by preparing her for the market this is quite interesting because the formulation is a little different from becker becker's understanding of the market is a place where buyers and sellers interact Gilman uses more of an Adam Smith idea of market. Market is equal to demand. The same formulation that later Rosa Luxemburg uses in accumulation and capital. The idea of is there a market for this? It's a demand side thinking. You know, so men are demand, women are supply, right? And what is being supplied here? Care work, right? Sexual care work, domestic care work of all types. Gilman's ideas were also somewhat revolutionary, but not in the Marxian sense, more in the utopian sense. Uh, she talks about the social necessity of collective care networks. So motherhood for Gilman is a radical concept. The idea is that it creates a network of women based on compassion and sympathy. They don't have to be biological mothers. But rather, they are mothers in the sense that they provide care. And her idea was that, you know, in the 19th century, so it's, you know, totally predates her time, that women would come together in networks of care and look out for one another and be there for one another, which would allow for greater space and time for each woman to develop her potential beyond the domestic sphere. Right. And that is something that, you know, exists very much today in the way that women interact with one another. So the idea of the squad, right, the idea of friends getting together, you know, helping each other out with homework, with therapy, with care, uh, or like say in grad school, you know, where, you know, most women who are in grad school have very little money and can't afford professional care work. So they watch each other's children. They, they uh, you know, host each other's parents when they come. So these are like networks of care, which Gilman thought of as a revolutionary idea. So, you know, this is early 19th century feminist economics thinking, right? And of course, Gilman was very, very racist, uh, but we're not going to go there, you know. Most everything that people write isn't great. So you don't want to necessarily entirely cancel people out. But it's also interesting to see some of these insights from their work, which existed, you know, in the history of economic thought. So, you know, if I go back to my timeline, I'm going to skip many years, right? 1898 is, uh, you know, civil war, America, things are 
pretty dire. Uh, Adam Smith by this time has written Wealth of Nations. Malthus, Ricardo have written, Marx is writing, right, still, still around, I guess, at that time, or I'm not sure, I've lost track of the time. But you know, the classical political economy framework has pretty much been set. The neoclassical revolution hasn't yet taken place. However, uh, I'm going to skip many years ahead now. Thorstein Veblen also by the early 20th century has written about, you know, uh, ideas of uh, division of labor, why idea, why division of labor happens, why is division of labor detrimental to women. So, you know, these ideas have already happened by the time we get to the 1970s. And by the 1970s, we find ourselves in the face of a very interesting political movement, which working class women start. And that is when Maria Rosa Dalla Costa and Selma James write their revolutionary essay called The Power of Women and the Subversion of the Community. And their idea was basically a challenge to vintage notions of the housewife, you know, the 1950s idea of the American housewife. And you must have seen many of these, uh, you know, famous pictures, these vintage images of, you know, rosy cheeked white woman, um, you know, washing dishes and keeping a very uh, nice home for the husband. You might have seen some of those uh, sitcoms also, for example, if you see I Dream of Jeannie, you know, that, that's, a, that's a good idea of the kind of work that was expected of women at the time. Or if you've watched Bewitched, you know, which is also an old kind of show, American show, which idealizes this notion of women staying at home, cooking, cleaning, husband comes back, you greet him with a smile, uh, give him whatever his dinner, and you know, that kind of thing. Now, Maria Rosa Dalla Costa and Selma James started writing about housework as an economic category, you know, mostly in economic literature at this time, you don't see the notion of housework as work, as labor, as, an, as something that is within the subject matter of economics, right? So uh, according to them, Dalla Costa and James, what the housewife produces at home is not just a use value. You know, Marxists uh, would consider production of use value as unproductive labor. So for example, the work of a teacher in, uh, you know, she's not producing anything that can be sold for profit in the old way of thinking. So that's just unproductive labor or use value. Similarly, housework by early Marxian thinking is use value. Right? Rather, they believed that housework is tied to the capitalist, uh, you know, to the capitalist logical process. So they're not just producing use values, but they're producing a commodity. And that commodity is the labor power of their husbands who then go into the market, the labor market and sell their labor power. So that's where the notion of social reproduction is also coming from in a very intimate way. Like, you know, you ask, okay, so labor power goes into the market and then produces surplus value and, uh, you know, the commodity is sold and it's realized and so on and so forth. Surplus value later accrues to the capitalist as profit. Um, according to Dalla Costa and James, uh, they ask the question, where is this labor power coming from? Who is producing it? And they come to the conclusion that it is the housewife who is producing labor power. So therefore, women are always workers, right? In capitalism, all women are workers. The productivity of the housewife is like a precondition for the productivity of the male wage laborer, right? The nuclear family, which is organized, it's protected by the state, it's like a factory, it's a social factory where labor power is produced. And then that labor power goes into the formal paid labor system and produces uh, surplus value and you know, realizes its own value and so on. So therefore, housewives and their labor 
they are not outside the process of surplus value production. Rather, they are the very foundation on which surplus labor production can get started. So the housewife and her labor are essentially the basis of capital accumulation. Sorry about the typo there. And that really, you know, that, that's a revolution in thought in a way. Why is that a big challenge to Marxism? Because until now, you know, Friedrich Engels, uh, Engels does have uh, his own analysis of, uh, you know, unequal power relations between men and women. Uh, his idea is from origins of the family, the state and private property. And he traces the oppression of women, its oppression and not exploitation in Engels, to the uh, you know, sexual division of labor, right? And the origin of private property, where women are basically thrown out of the process of value creation or surplus value creation. Dalla Costa and James say, no, you are invisibilizing the fact that women have in fact been part of producing this very labor value, which is producing the surplus value. Women are very much part of the process of production of surplus labor. Okay, so that's a challenge. It's a challenge to Marxism, right? And that is where uh, Heidi Hartman starts to write then about the unhappy marriage of Marxism and feminism. What is it that Marxism says to women? Marxism, according to Hartman, understands women's work as uh, basically, uh, you know, something tied to private property. It is bourgeois women who have private property, who are confined to the home, who are, you know, uh, supposed to be decorative, who don't have rights, who are outside the surplus value generating process. And if women have to be liberated, then they just need to overthrow capitalism and overthrow private property, after which care work will be socialized and women can participate in the value production process on equal terms as men. Right. Hartman believes that the woman question in Marxism has up till date never been a feminist question because Marxists have always looked at the relationship between women and the production process. Even if you think of women as workers, you think about women as workers in the construct of the wider production process, right? What they have not looked at is the relationship, the intimate relationship between women and men. So Hartman says that no, socialism will not necessarily make women better off, you know? Even, uh, even proletarian men are interested in the continued exploitation of women. Uh, women being exploited means that they get freedom from housework because women do the housework. They also get better job market outcomes if someone else is looking after the kids and you know taking care of everything at home, then you can concentrate more on your market labor and on climbing you know, the segregated job market outcomes and try to get better job market outcomes. So, you know, if women are constantly depending on men to bring about socialism and liberate them, that's not going to happen. It's not necessarily true that in a socialist economy, women will necessarily be better off because frankly, men have much to gain from the sexual exploitation and the oppression of women. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm just going to take a quick question. Um, let's see, what have I got here from Onesha? She says, don't know if it's appropriate to comment at this point, but just an observation. The idea of collective care was present in the joint family structure in India. Was this as common in the Western world? Huh, nice. She says, uh, it's also commensurate with the practice in the animal world. Okay, I'm not going to jump to the animal world right now. That's a bit outside my area. But uh, yeah, so you're saying that collective care is there in the joint family structure. Sure. I don't know if uh, Charlotte Gilman would, uh, you know, consider that as revolutionary. 
because there are hierarchies involved. Uh, I will discuss at this point, actually in the very next slide, the work of Kandiyoti, where she talks about the patriarchal bargain in Asian and African societies. So uh, I think Gilman is drawing mostly from her understanding of a nuclear family. And that might also be because Gilman herself was in a nuclear family at the time, uh, did not have much support from other women. She also felt a sense of isolation in you know, her specific uh, social conditioning. So maybe that draws from there. So yeah, this is definitely, definitely uh, more of a Western uh, idea of radicalism. And they have not yet actually dealt with the notion of hierarchies, uh, you know, patriarchal hierarchies within the family as they will arise in, you know, should were an Asian person or an African person writing. So I'll get there. I, I'll talk a little bit more about the Asian case when I get to the work of Kandiyoti, which is on this slide. Okay. So, you know, until now, uh, is what have we talked about? We have talked about how feminists start challenging Marxian thought. This is still in the 1970s, so it's still much more relevant to the discussion than it is today because, you know, in those days, socialism was a very real thing. You have the USSR is very much, uh, you know, power and a superpower, in fact. So it makes sense at that time to sit down and talk about women's liberation through socialism. Is it really happening? According to Engels, Engels, I always mispronounce his name, it should be happening. Hackman says, it's not happening because in fact, men still have a continued uh, something to gain. They already have a continued interest in the exploitation and the oppression of women. One of the major, dis one of the major highlights that has occurred by this point is the notion of uh, feminine, I mean, of women's work or of women being exploited in capitalism and not just oppressed. So, you know, in Marxist discussion, there is a hierarchy between exploitation and oppression. Uh, exploitation refers to uh, the surplus labor production process. So if your labor is producing surplus value for somebody else, if you are, in other words, reproducing not just your own labor, but also, uh, you know, working more than is necessary to reproduce yourself. And that surplus is then, you know, going up the value chain to the capitalists and accrues to them as profit, then you are exploited. So Dalla Costa and James basically understand women as exploited and not just oppressed. I mean, I know the just term is a very value laden term here, I shouldn't say that, but you know, that that's how the Marxists uh, differentiate exploitation from oppression. But now it gets a little bit more complex because we, now we start talking about second wave feminism. Sylvia Federici in 1975, and this is work she developed later in 2002 and so on. But this was as far back as 1975, where she began developing the idea of sexuality as work, right? And that's where we start talking about sex work as work. And that is something that still doesn't exist in a lot of working class politics today, right? Uh, why is sex work work? And sex work here means all kinds of sex work, not just paid sex work, but also unpaid sex work, which is what women do in their homes. Because, uh, you know, and here Federici draws a distinction between the home and the workplace. Capitalism is necessarily premised upon the creation, I mean, of separating the home and the workplace as separate from one another. The logic of the home is that, you know, uh, what is the old phrase? For an Englishman, the home is his castle. It doesn't matter if the home is a hut, but when he is at home, he is the boss. And, you know, all the women of the house have to, uh, you know, basically perpetuate that hierarchy of the man of the house as the boss, you know? Um, 
and uh, the home is supposed to be a place of sharing of kindness of care a place where care work is essentially created where human beings can replenish themselves body and mind so that they can then go out into the capitalist world which is you know the firm and input their labor right and you know turn their labor power into absolute labor so now silvia federici sees the home then as a place for replenishment not for women but for men women are supposed to create the affects or the care work which allows men to go into the workplace and uh, you know perform their labor you know convert their labor power into labor and sexuality you know sex work is an important part of doing that of helping somebody else replenish himself body and mind and therefore silvia federici thinks of sex work as work sex work is as tied to the surplus value production process as housework is and in fact she also throws in the additional caveat that with sex work it can sometimes be a little bit more daunting as well because you're not just supposed to you know provide this kind of care work but you're also supposed to make it look like you're enjoying it so that's an, that's an additional feature of sex work right uh maria mees also uh now maria mees's work is also revolutionary in many ways because she draws very heavily from the work of rosa luxemburg and rosa luxemburg at this point has been heavily critiqued huh? she's come across as an underconsumptionist and the work of paul sweezy uh, broadly misunderstood um, many people say uh, you know dob sweezy others they say that uh, rosa luxemburg's work is uh, not empirically proven and they have rejected her thesis of imperialism Mies, however, does the very brave thing and looks at Rosa Luxemburg's understanding of primitive accumulation. What is primitive accumulation? Primitive accumulation is a set of processes by which the social conditions for capitalism can take place. You know, it's a set of processes that allow the accumulation of capital to take place. So, if you're asking. you know how how is it that labor is constantly coming to the factory to work why is labor coming into the factory to work because labor is not able to uh, get the means of livelihood for itself you know in the feudal era you have access to the commons you have access to the pastures if you have a sheep you can take your sheep to graze in the pasture uh when the sheep gets old you cut it up and eat it uh you take the wool of the sheep and make yourself a little sweater uh you know you take the sheep's milk and you get your children to drink it you know most people had access to their own processes of uh, of life but after the enclosure movement comes about in the 15th century in england most uh, people are divorced from the means of subsistence uh through violence commons are taken away from each person and then each person is left with no option but to you know go and work in wage labor processes in order to earn a livelihood hey right. now both silvia federici and maria mees uh, go on to talk about how patriarchy helps the process of primitive accumulation Federici talks about uh, witchcraft you know the idea the medieval practice of casting women as witches and burning them at the stake which enforced the idea of the docile women and also broke the solidarity between the working classes right uh, which of course allowed uh, nobles and landlords to steal the commons and prevent working class revolt to the stealing of the commons right uh, yeah and mees also talks about uh, you know other uh, other ways in which patriarchy helps create the conditions for the accumulation of capital 
Witchcraft is a very Western term, but if you consider colonization, you know, uh, Federici talks about Caliban and the witch. The idea of uh, women in colonial spaces as practicing some kind of devi deviancy or some kind of witchcraft or, you know, outside of the Christian ideal of what a woman should be like and enforcing, you know, sexual monogamy, um, housework, domesticity in women that helped create the conditions for capitalism. Okay, so, so that's basically Federici Mies' work. Hartman says that patriarchy also creates the conditions for the occupational segregation of labor. And that is very important in capitalism because, you know, uh, it, it also helps create the idea that if you work hard, you will climb the ladder and get to supervisor positions and earn more and so on and so forth. So, you know, when, uh, so women typically end up in the lower paid jobs as secretaries, as uh, wage workers, uh, garment workers, factory workers, while men then become supervisors. And that is at every, you know, kind of job, even in white collar jobs, if you see who are the TAs, usually women, who are the tenured senior professors, usually men, right? So, so that's how it goes. Now I come to my favorite, which is uh, Kandiyoti. Hang on, there is a question here from Siddharth. I'll take this one and then I'll get to Kandiyoti because she's a bit more complex. He says, I can understand the effect that a healthy sex life has on labor productivity, but how do we isolate the value women add to labor by sex and the pleasure they must be deriving themselves from sex at home? Uh, now we're coming to the question of the separative self, but we're not there yet. Wouldn't that count as a difference between sex work as a profession or sex at home? Or are we saying that sex is always a transfer of value from women to men? That's a very interesting question because so think about any, any kind of work that you do. You know, I, let's see, doing this presentation, this is work, right, for me but I'm thoroughly enjoying it, <laughs> right? Work is not something that you always dislike, you know? So saying that sex work is work doesn't necessarily mean that women always dislike sex or that one needs to separate the enjoyment from sex to the actual work aspect of it. Work is not, I mean, Thorstein Beblin wrote in the early 20th century, he, it's a very nice essay, you guys can check it out. It's called uh, The Instinct of Workmanship and the, uh, you know, the Burden of Labor. I've forgotten the exact term. Uh, but he, he basically says that it's called The Instinct of Workmanship and the idea of labor as a burden. He says that, you know, evolutionarily speaking, after all, if humans have to evolve and, you know, produce society and create social frameworks, then they have to enjoy working. You know, they have to enjoy innovating, they have to enjoy pushing the boundaries, they have to enjoy doing research, they have to enjoy engineering and producing stuff for one another, right? So there is definitely a, an aspect of enjoyment that exists with work. Uh, the idea that work is burdensome is subject to certain uh, institutions like slavery, where, you know, People are uh, stolen from their social frameworks, brought to another uh, tribe, and then forced to do the work that no one else wants to do. That is when work becomes burdensome. And that's also where Weblin draws this idea of uh, ownership marriage or women's work as devalued. He says that, you know, if you are, say, a woman from an Iroquois tribe uh, in North America, and you get stolen from your tribe and taken to another tribe. And now, you know, you don't have any rights over your own children that you bear. You're supposed to provide sex work. You're supposed to do the kind of work that no one else wants to do. Then you will, you know, stop enjoying it. So it's basically a question of work processes or institutions behind work that make work uh, burdensome. The word I was looking for is irksome. Uh, the paper is called The Instinct of Workmanship and the Irksomeness of Labor. 
So you can, you can check this out. But let me get to Kandiyoti. Kandiyoti's work is actually very, very interesting. It's one of my favorite pieces. Uh, she wrote this in 1988, and she calls it Bargaining with Patriarchy. Her work is on, you know, it, it's a bit different from most Marxian feminist uh, work because it basically puts some agency in the hands of women. You know, it puts agency in the hands of the subject. And it says that women themselves uh, sign into patriarchy in some sort of way because uh, it, they manage to find ways in which they can make patriarchal institutions work for them. So she cites two sets of examples. One is the African example. The African uh, you know, institutions of marriage are a little bit different from the Asian institutions. African institutions are polygamous. So one man, usually a slightly elderly man, will have multiple wives. And when he acquires a wife, so as to speak, uh, he has to basically give each wife a plot of land to take. So most women in African societies have uh, you know, some land and some cattle that they can call their own. So when they bargain with patriarchy, their idea is to try to maximize their land holding and their uh, asset holding as opposed to other women. Most women are not considered to, uh, you, you know, uh, they're not considered to be dependent on men in many of these kinds of societies. Rather, they're supposed to, you know, reproduce the conditions for their own life and support their own children from the endowments that they are given at the time of marriage. And in return, they cannot ask very much out of the man. They can't ask that he doesn't take on an additional wife. They can't ask that he cares for them and so on and so forth, right? On the flip side, in the Asian, Indo-Asian, it's Asian and also European, like I think Adyoti was also talking about Turkey. So uh, Eurasia. Eurasian patriarchy, it's a bit different. In Eurasian patriarchy, when a woman goes from uh, her household, her natal household, to the household that she marries into, then she becomes essentially a dispossessed individual. She loses all rights to her natal property. And she becomes a part of the household of the man. And there she has no right to inherit property. So in that case, the best option, I mean, even here, you know, fighting that patriarchy is almost impossible because you're dispossessed. You have nothing of your own. So fighting that patriarchy only becomes, you know, it, it's not very useful to do if you're isolated. The one way in which you can bargain for yourself and, you know, get some agency, get some power in that situation, control your fate, is to try to have a male child and bargain through the male child. You know, the child will bargain for you, the son will bargain for the mother. And that creates a particularly interesting relationship between sons and mothers, where women try to have sons. And usually women try to uh, dominate their sons. They try to ensure that the son doesn't get too close to the daughter-in-law. They try to ensure that uh, you know, that the son advocates for the mother and not for the daughter-in-law. And that creates uh, its own kind of patriarchal bargaining, which causes that particular clash also, the legendary clash between Sas and Babu, so as to speak. Now you know why I like this paper. <laughs> right? Okay, uh, should I stop at Kandiyoti because I'm sure you'll have some questions. Yeah, of course, there are questions. Let's see. Uh, so Sebanti here says, this is more of an observation. I have often noticed caregiving work is passed on from upper caste women to lower caste women or from white women to black women. Can we say that networks of care among women are often defined by caste race? Uh, you are just coming to the next part of my presentation, which is the challenge of black feminist political economy. And, you know, the, the movement of, um, you know, 
of the African Americans for civil rights is a, is a movement that the Dalit movement has drawn a lot of inspiration from. It is, is the Dalit movement is essentially a civil rights movement. So, you know, you've just anticipated the next part of my presentation. I'll come to that. Onisha says, isn't monogamy a form of idealized slavery with an essential loyalty component infused into it? You're right in many ways, you know. See, even in the African societies, while they are polygamous, it's not that the women have the ability to take on other lovers except in rare cases where, uh, you know, if you're talking about uh, particular women or uh, I think Grieber also talks about the concept of the village wife, where a woman is able to run away from her tribe, run to another tribe, and then she becomes the village wife, where, you know, she is able to maintain some degree of sexual autonomy and take on lovers and so on. But uh, essentially, in both kinds of patriarchy, African and Asian, women do not have a chance to commit what is called adultery. You know, uh, even if they're, they're in a polygamous relationship, they can't be with another man. Right? The difference is that they will have some land and some cattle which will be allocated to them. And then their economic bargaining, like you have collective bargaining, you know, trade unions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, management, student union vis-a-vis -vis administration, just like that, women bargain, but at an individual level, vis-a-vis -vis patriarchy and vis-a-vis -vis their patriarchal institutions. The nature of the bargaining is different. In African societies, you are bargaining from, for more land, more cattle, more control over your assets. In Eurasian society, you don't get to bargain over uh, assets because you don't have any assets, you're dispossessed. So in that case, you will then be bargaining through the one piece of labor power that you have some control over, which is your male child. And, uh, you know, for, I mean, I've met a lot of young men who are permanently frustrated with their mothers who are constantly being told uh, who are constantly telling them up uh, you know tell your papa to do this tell your papa to do that a lot of female children also actually nowadays end up with the same pressures because you know because of the absence of a male child or the emotional rejection of the male child so you know that that, that is part of the way in which women are trying to carve out a little bit of power for themselves in a patriarchal setup. Right. Yeah. I was explaining that to my friend recently who was complaining about her mom. <laughs> so, yeah, don't come to me for life advice. I will throw academic papers at you. <laughs> anyway. But I get to the next part of my presentation, which is the challenge of black feminist political economy. Okay, so until now, we have mostly been talking about from the Kandyoti paper with a very Western bias. And actually that is a major limitation of my presentation till now and of the way I've been trained and the way I understand feminist economics till now, which is that it has a Western bias. You know, we're talking about 19th century, pre-Civil War era, where most women who are writing are women who have leisure to write. And that will typically be white women from, uh, you know, uh, leisure class societies like Gilman herself. Right. And uh, when we talk about Marxist feminism, we are, you know, also talking mostly about Western women. But Marxism at this point is no longer really just a Western philosophy. By the 1970s, Marxism was international. Uh, it, it was international before that. It was international by the 1920s. And uh, say this paper by Kandiyoti, it also talks about very specific non-Western institutions within which women bargain. Okay. Now, the black feminist political economy's challenge is a completely different aspect. Okay. Uh, and that basically draws from the work of uh, Sojourner Truth. Sorry, I skipped over. Sojourner Truth was, uh, gave a speech in 1851 
at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron in Ohio. At this point, civil war still happening, slavery is still very much a thing. And she says that, and this is during the abolition movement, you know, Susan B. Anthony and uh, the suffragettes are then fighting for votes for women in free America. America at that time is considered free, but of course there is the institution of slavery, which is antithetical to everything that that particular nation stands for. And Sajana Truth goes in and she says, that man over there, she's referring to somebody who, uh, you know, is, is saying that women need special treatment, they won't be able to vote and he's infantilizing women. So she says, that man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages, lifted over ditches and to have the best place at Uber. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles, she's a former slave, or gives me any best place. An entire woman, look at me, look at my arms. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could hit me. An entire woman, I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. Entire woman, I have borne 13 children and seen most all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me, an entire woman. Right. So the, the relationship of black women with capitalism and with patriarchy is a very different experience than that of white women. Black women have been perceived differently from white women, uh, their sex or their gender, whatever, however you want to see it, is no protection against the field work, cotton picking, and at the same time, you know, rape is also used as a punishment for women. Men will get flogged if they don't do their work in the fields properly with the same productivity. Women will not only be flogged, they will also be raped. So, you know, rape comes in as punishment in a sort of way. And rape is also, you know, uh, like to the black feminist political economy movement, it is no surprise that rape is not desired. They understand rape as power, you know, just like the Dalit movement also understands rape as an expression of power more than an expression of anything else, right? So that's where the notion of intersectionalities comes in. And you must have heard this term now, it is quite popular, the idea of intersectionality, of identity politics, uh, you know, feminist politics is identity politics, whether or not it is or it isn't. Should identity politics be taken seriously or not? I'm sure these are all very big discussions in JNU. Uh, they were just starting when I was still around and I'm sure that they are now very big, important issues. So, you know, similarly with the black feminist political economy movement, they came up with the idea of intersectionality and they brought it up in the Kumbahi River Collective. You can read their statement online they affirm that, you know, that a black woman in herself is inherently valuable. And that becomes very important for them to say, because, uh, you know, because only if they ascertain the human rights and the human, you know, the value of somebody for being a human being, you know, that is inherently valued. Now that is very different from the way economics, the economics field has looked at women or looked at commodities or looked at value in general. What is value in economics? For those of you who know your classical political economy very well, value, uh, you know, the joke used to be what? That uh, classical political economy is the value of everything and the price of nothing. And neoclassical economics is the price of everything and the value of nothing. Right? Because what is neoclassical economics interested in teaching you? How prices are determined. And what is classical political economy interested in teaching you? Labor theory of value and solving the transformation problem. Right? So now value in economics or classical political economy is what? It is basically the amount of labor power within any object. Right? Poster amount of labor hours spent in weaving this cloth and sewing this coaster, right? 
now you know for uh, and that that basically then ties down to like then in that case what is labor power labor power is the uh, amount of labor that has gone into creating the necessities of life that each human being consumes right that idea is completely antithetical to human rights in itself in that case uh do we start saying like basically that value is basically as much labor that has gone into something whereas if you take you know people on whom not much is invested uh people who are dalits people who uh have been enslaved uh these are people on whom you know society has not invested a lot of resources so you know that that already is a major challenge to the idea of value in economics when you say that i am a human being respect me as a human being give me human rights that itself means that you now need to start thinking about value differently value no longer is the amount of labor power invested in a particular thing but rather value is something that originates out of being human so you know that, that's also where you know and, and that that is actually a major challenge for economics in very major ways and uh, yeah so that's where you start getting identity politics in economics and now this becomes also very important for economic literature because that's when you start seeing the discrimination literature so the discrimination literature is mostly econometric work uh it's a type of decomposition called the wahaka blinder decomposition and usually in this uh system of econometric work usually they try to understand how uh, how much of difference in somebody's wages is because of race how much is because of gender how much is because of uh, you know of just pure discrimination and the wahaka blinder decomposition is able to actually you know ascribe a certain value to a person's wage is because of patriarchy or because of racism so you know this then becomes a major uh, type of research of a major research agenda which is later done in most of economic thought so 1970s you start seeing the famous wahaka blinder decomposition now that brings us to neoclassical economics okay so just as in the 1970s 80s you start it becomes now possible with you know advances in econometrics to be able to actually separate how much of discrimination is because of race how much because of gender you know and be able to understand discrimination as you know at the intersections of many different things how much of it is because of differences in education how much of it is because of differences in work experience and how much of it simply cannot be explained and therefore is because of patriarchy or is because of racism that's when you start seeing feminist critics in neoclassical economics now this is actually very very important work in many ways and this uh, usually starts in the 1990s when julie nelson starts writing and what can you read on this you can read this very fabulous book of essays it's in two volume, volumes uh, by nancy uh, Na by julie nelson and marian ferber it's called beyond economic man volume 1 and volume 2 only in volume 2 in the last chapter do you have any discussion of post colonial feminism ha huh? i should warn you about that uh, we are still very western biased in many ways anyhow uh what is their critique what is the critique of nelson ferber francis woolley which you read um uh, and others they understand the hierarchy in economic thought uh produced through gender you know gender becomes now a type of value system different from the marxian value system marxian value system is about of labor power 
uh, in a commodity on average. Right. But there are other kinds of value systems. Thorstein Veblen talks about instrumental and ceremonial value. What is the instrumental value of this bottle? The fact that I can drink water out of it. You know, but there are ceremonial values. For example, if I take this book, you know, it's much more than the paper that it's printed on. It represents a particular value in society. Being able to read gives me a certain a ceremonial kind of like that. Gender also becomes a value system. And masculine is seen superior to feminine. So there are certain values that are considered masculine values and certain values that are considered feminine values and masculine values, reason, rationality, quantification, they are considered to be superior than emotion, than uh, qualitative work. And that means that neoclassical economics, which has essentially one particular methodology, that methodology becomes superior to any other kind of methodology. In other words, if you want to write a dissertation in neoclassical economics, which many of you will want to do, you will have to follow one of those methods. There will either be a Cobb-Douglas function or a CES function or some sort of function with the nice mathematical properties, right? Uh, that will compose that will comprise your model or you will do econometrics in which case you will produce an econometric model and try to separate out each kind of phenomena and understand how one creates uh, you know how uh, education has a different impact on gender gap in wages and experience has a different impact on gender gap in wages gender has a different gap on different effect on gender gap in wages. Uh, race has a different effect of gender gap in wages. And the econometric method allows you to then separate out the effects of each kind of phenomena. Right? So typically, there are very few methods that you use. And those very few methods have a certain value attributed to them. That value is because they are masculine. Right? So just take this description. I pulled it out of Econometrica's description, which it still goes around, uh, you know, uh, if you look for the Econometrica on Google and you look at the About Us column, this is how the Econometrica describes itself. As you guys know, it's one of the foremost journals in economics. It says, the Econometrica publishes original articles in all branches of economics theoretical and empirical, abstract and applied, providing wide ranging coverage across the subject area. This is fine. Now what happens? It promotes studies that aim at the unification of theoretical quantitative and empirical quantitative approach to economic problems. And that are penetrated by constructive and rigorous thinking. So already you see some sort of a rape analogy. You know, the idea of something of rigor, logic, uh, penetrating of uh, emotion or fuzziness or anything that cannot be quantified and easily categorized. Right? So the idea of economics as a very quant first approach, both theoretical and empirical, but essentially measurable, draws you know, this idea is fundamentally sexist. It's a sexist bias. And this pertains to anything that involves measurement, right? Uh, say, for example, a professor is going for promotion. What will the professor be asked when she's going for promotion? How many papers have you published? And in what, journal, what journals of what rank and how many citations have you got? If you there are professors who don't publish a lot. Rather, they would prefer spending time teaching, spending time interacting with young people, mentoring young people. And that kind of work is as important for a university as, uh, you know, as quantitative work, 
right? Or as uh, research, which is published in Scopus Index journals. It's also possible that you will sign up for slightly tougher projects, which will take more time to publish. Usually professors like that will not get tenure, right? Consider students. What determines the value of a student or whether a student gets promoted to the next class or you know whether a student makes it into the college of her choice? Usually what marks she has got. Nobody will ask you how much time you spend doing student activism. You probably can't put that on your CV. I know mine is not on my CV, <laughs> right? Uh, nobody will ask you how much time you spent uh, talking to your friends and uh, dealing with life issues. Nobody's interested in whether you tutored somebody who was very much in need of help. Care work gets devalued in a framework of measurability because until now, care work has not been measured. Similarly, this restriction of tools to, you know, very few uh, theoretical or empirical tools creates a kind of bias within the profession, which actually makes the profession less rather than more scientific. Uh, Paula England talks about, and this is where I come to Siddharth's question, which I said I was going to save for later, the idea of separation versus connectedness. Why is that important? Because women are typically trained to uh, have a slightly connected approach to their thinking. You know, the, the idea becomes, um, um, how, how should I say, like you're always concerned about the well being of the family rather than the well being of yourself, because that is a feminine value. And women are usually trained like that so that they can reproduce their families and provide care work. Whereas men are trained from a very early age. And you know, if you look at the Freudian revolution, you'll see how they are trained for very early age to reject care, to reject where they come from, uh, to pull themselves away from their family. You'll see from, you know, boys as they start growing up, the first thing that they start to resent is their mothers. Because you have to, uh, and, and society, you know, uh, is focused on, bringing up men to start resenting their mothers or usually the nannies that also creates racism. You know, if you follow the work of Anne McClintock, Imperial Leather, where, you know, the first things that children are trained to do is to resent their mothers and to resent their nannies. If you see children's books, very early age, orphan boy, you know, uh, uh, Harry Potter lost his parents at a very young age because you want your hero to be someone who is a unit by himself, you know, and that is also a part of a culturally, uh, um, culturing young men or, you know, the culture of young boys to be able to separate themselves. You see the separation value in economic thought as well. What is econometrics? Econometrics is essentially about separation. You know, uh, from a very early age when I was running my first regressions, I was taught that uh, regression is important because you have to compare like with like. If you're comparing, uh, you know, say students, uh, you want to compare students' uh, marks difference. You know, you don't want to compare students from different economic backgrounds. You want to compare students from the same income background and then look at the difference in marks and see why that's happening. So, you know, if you're, but, but if you actually see, you know, go into a regression and deconstruct a regression, we don't actually compare, you know, like with like. Rather, what that CLRM algorithm does, it helps you attribute or separate how much of marks difference is because of income, how much of marks difference is because of gender, how much of marks difference is because of, uh, you know, the town that you come from, whether you come from a tier one, tier two, tier three, or tier four town, and so on and so forth. Right. So the emphasis on separation vis-a-vis -vis connectedness 
is a fundamental bias in neoclassical economics and the idea that you cannot do it, that you cannot adopt any other methodology other than you know just the theoretical modeling or econometrics is a fundamental problem with neoclassical economics so feminist economics especially in the neoclassical tradition is fundamentally a response to the beckerian revolution gary becker talks about marriage as a market the family uh, you know he talks about uh, how men and women bargain within the family and uh, you know they do what they have comparative advantage in women have comparative advantage in housework men have comparative advantage in market work and feminist economics becomes a response to that or a challenge to the beckerian revolution so what's the idea here the idea here is that mainstream economics uh, is basically based on markets and this is something that you know very diverse sets of eco economists agree someone like robert heilbronner who is all about the history of economic thought and someone like gary becker who is all about quant methods they all agree that economics is about the market and about taking the market logic to all aspects of human behavior dating market marriage market what is dowry dowry is a price on the marriage market um, you know all, all other kinds of markets i'm not being able to think right now job market right so the idealized market then is a place where you have people who are rational masculine value autonomous means they act separately from everyone else so separateness value anonymous so they don't come from any religious cultural affiliation again no connectedness but separate separativeness right they have stable preferences and they interact and they exchange that itself is comes with a sexist bias right it is based on a sexist idea right and you know that weddedness to rationality and that weddedness to people who are separated from their social uh, context that is a fundamental problem in neoclassical economics and that is something that feminists are challenging so it's a very fundamental kind of challenge uh, i have a few more slides to cover but let me take some questions there are three hang on ha uh, labisha says idea of dowry doesn't make economic sense is it more societal no that dowry is a completely economic concept uh, concept uh, becker understands it as a price in the marriage market in his treaties of marriage and uh, you know that that's something that feminists are challenging like we know oldenburg um shrinivas i think r shrinivas many others are challenging this idea of dowry as a price on the marriage market rather they see dowry as an institution in itself which arises uh, for various reasons and it arises differently in different uh, contexts in india my argument mine and kalpana khanel's uh, read that paper and cite it please because you know i have to get a promotion but still <laughs> so my paper basically says that uh, dowry is uh, essentially an institution and in india dowry arises because of the dispossession element of a of marriage so uh, it actually draws from uh, laws like the laws of manu where fathers are obliged to give their daughters up in marriage so that you know their sexual labor is used up in society and not withdrawn from society and basically just like you know sin becomes a burden a woman is considered a her father's burden and he has to like it's a fundamental responsibility it's a law he has to give his daughter up in marriage it's part of what a girl's father is supposed to do and it's considered a burden and just like the banaras brahmins you know uh, they derive their livelihood from swallowing up the burden or the sin of the world similarly sons in law are considered to uh, 
basically take the burden of the girl child from the father and that is why they are treated with a lot of ostentation and a lot of uh, you know here take this car here take this house and that's where dowry originates it's a one way transfer it's a basically a non reciprocal gift as called in mausian uh, economics uh, it, it's it's an institution which perpetuates uh, the idea of uh, neonatal marriages you know when a girl is dispossessed taken out of her own house and sent to the community of the husband stripped of all her assets and then becomes basically labor power and dowry is what accompanies her when she does that and it's not to her benefit uh, it is to the benefit of the you know son's family because essentially it is like a, a you know it, it, it's like a dan the idea of dan in uh, hindu culture uh, it arises in order to compensate in some sort of way the other person for taking on the burden but yeah that's just my argument uh yeah, i have an anonymous question here don't women have their own labor power yes that's what i've been saying all this while uh essentially sexual subjugation is the subjugation of women's labor power especially in land poor and asset poor households where women are active participants in the labor market how does earning one's own wage to meet consumption needs fit into the challenge that women's work poses to patriarchy and capitalist structures well i mean i i don't know why i i didn't mean to say that you know women don't have their own labor power or something i mean the point that i was trying to make till now is that uh, you know women's labor power is exploited by capitalist systems either directly or indirectly i didn't draw a lot on direct exploitation i talked more about indirect exploitation which is usually housework performed in the home is a translation of labor power into labor and that then creates surplus labor which is uh, accrues to the capitalists as profit right so you know that that that's how the labor power gets exploited but also if you are considering uh, you know direct labor power or the chains as you can as you will the chains of uh, you know uh, outsourcing so as uh, you know more and more women are entering agricultural work entering housework uh, you see uh, you know you see women's work in operation uh, and that comes i mean that that is a challenge to the capitalist revolution to capitalism in many ways because firstly this is exploited labor super exploited on account of you know you are able to pay lower wages it keeps wages down so whenever there is more accumulation of capital uh, more women are drawn into the labor force uh, which helps uh, keep the wages down and allows for greater profits to be made so you know that that's very much there you're asking how it poses a challenge it poses a challenge through the strike you know when women cease to do housework or when they cease to do a uh, work in the uh, capitalist spaces when they go on strike that's when the conflict happens right okay so i have gone on for quite a while it's already 320 so we should uh, start wrapping up with you know the new feminist economics and uh, social reproduction theory which is actually the most important thing right now uh, the idea like what is the answer to the separative self how do we solve how do we uh, deal with the challenge of uh, separation in the answer is to take a care framework you know to try to understand human beings as you know providing labor of care and uh, of trying to understand care networks now not all of these care networks are necessarily non exploitative i know charlotte gilham gilman has a slightly utopian idea of care networks but care networks in capitalism are 
you know, often exploitative and mostly exploitative. They're based by, on, uh, like say, if you notice, uh, women of higher income households, they typically do a lot less housework than women of lower income households. And that is because they are able to outsource their care work, either through nannies and, uh, you know, through uh, domestic work or through uh, buying takeout, you know, like mostly purchasing food from outside, purchasing finished goods, uh, producing less within the home and, uh, you know, taking their laundry to somewhere else to be done, you know, get, getting their dry cleaning done. So through these processes, there are, there are outsourced ways of care that are created, right? Not all care is unpaid, a lot of it is paid. And then comes this issue of how to measure care. Since economics is so heavily obsessed with measurement and there is a value to things that are measurable vis-a-vis -vis things that are not, it then becomes important to be able to measure care and to you know, be able to understand economics from the viewpoint of care labor, which is as measurable as every other type of labor. Just because it's not necessarily monetized or undervalued, doesn't mean it can't be measured. And that is where time use research becomes very important. Uh, you all must be aware, India published its own time use study in 2019. Um, I still haven't seen the micro data, I should go and look for it. But the report is out and uh, it basically shows that in India at least, rural women spend about four times the amount of time that me rural men spend in housework and urban women spend about three times the amount of labor. The same figure for the United States, because that's the only day, other data that I've looked at personally. Uh, the relationship is one is to two. In India, it is one is to three, and in rural areas, one is to four, right? So, you know, how do we measure care? There's also this issue of uh, measuring emotional labor. And now, you know, in most of the institutions that we develop, emotional labor has become very important. For example, when one of my mentors, Viviana Greco, went up for promotion from associate to full professor, then, uh, you know, she, along with the tenure package, she also produced evidence of her mentorship, you know, because that is a very important part of her work. Published research is not the only work that someone does. You also mentor students, you know, so, evidence of mentorship and considering that as something that has value is, you know, has now become um, important in assessing and evaluating somebody. So how do you measure affect? How do you measure emotional labor? Most things can be measured. It's just that your quantitative work has to be creative enough. Uh, women, when they do the second shift, or I, I'm calling it women's work, but essentially all kinds of care work, uh, you know, measuring that second shift, you know, measuring that additional burden that people bear for reproducing their homes, that becomes very important in today's new feminist economics. And then we have social reproduction theory. And this basically exactly the question that happened earlier, the issue of uh, trying to understand how capitalism is in a crisis of care. So just as capitalism is in crisis in terms of, uh, you know, Marx used to talk about the falling rate of profit. Uh, after that, there are new other kinds of crises, like some uh, scholars started talking about underconsumption crises. Some scholars started talking about disproportionality crises. Uh, Kaleski, which is much more common and much more empirically proven, starts talking about the wage goods crisis. Right, so there are various types of crises that occur in capitalism. And just like one of those crises, there is also the crisis of care. And that is something that Nancy Fraser talked about. I'm sure you all recognize all the faces going uh, clock, anti-clockwise. Nancy Folbray, Nancy Fraser, Jayati Ghosh, Titi Bhattacharj, right? These are people you, we should all be reading. And Nancy Fraser talks about uh, social reproduction uh, crisis as a care crisis. Capitalism is in a care crisis. Uh, you know, liberal capitalism basically 
privatized social reproduction by outsourcing it in the hands of, uh, you know, uh, outsourcing it through domestic work, through uh, daycare centers, through nannies, and so on, where the task of ensuring care for bourgeois households or high income households becomes a private issue. And that's why you then start having crises in terms of treatment of domestic workers, fair wages for domestic workers. Right now, India's major migration crisis is in part affected by the domestic care crisis. Because, you know, just as the migrant workers were invisible to the policymakers when they imposed lockdown, uh, domestic workers were also invisible in part as migrant workers and their work has been considered uh, invisible to economic policy and to economic theory for many years. So th this, this also presents a type of crisis, you know, humanitarian crises that occur, uh, the possible potential for sexual harassment of domestic workers, the uh, lack of regulations around uh, ensuring that domestic workers have proper wages, proper health care, proper benefits, pensions on retirement, right? So that's a type of crisis of care. State-managed capitalism in Western countries partially socialized social reproduction through the welfare system, but that too fell in crisis after Bill Clinton uh, came to power, right? Where welfare was pulled back. And today we have financialized capitalism, which is increasingly commodifying the task of social reproduction, constantly um, pushing it on, you know, to the extent that there was uh, at one time, uh, you know, women who were performing surrogacy labor for better off women. Uh, so, you know, that financial capitalism has been associated with increased commodification of women's bodies and women's labor, right? And that also has created its own kind of crisis, further invisibilization of domestic work, uh, further um, inability to understand, uh, you know, what can we do to ensure that women are able to take care of their children, that migrant workers are able to take care of children, that the national crash scheme actually works, that you know we are able to produce newer and newer uh, generations of workers uh, who have access to basic human rights, right? So that's basically your social reproduction. So yeah, I wanted to throw this question open to you. You know, intersectionality is something there's a lot of debate about. Prithi Bhattacharj, for instance, says that intersectionality is um, not something that, uh, you know, truly understands class and not truly uh, understands class politics and gives a lot of space to identity politics. Whereas, of course, Dalit feminist movements, Black feminist political uh, movements would disagree with that idea. So, but anyway, what do you guys think, uh, you know, what would be the new economics going forward? That would be for, well, I've got eight gray hairs now, so I'm a little older than you, uh, but you guys are younger and you will truly develop a truly intersectional care-centric economics. Okay, I will end show and take questions. Stop sharing if you want. Okay, there are some here. Uh, wait, there's some in the chat also. Okay, I dealt with the monogamy question. Dowry, I dealt with. Does dowry impact bargaining power of women in the household? Says Shivanti. I'm not sure. And I would think not because even when there is dowry, it doesn't really uh, impact. Usually the demands increase after that. You know, I mean, the, a lot of people think, uh, especially when people give dowry, uh, a lot of people also go into debt to give dowry. And their idea is to make hypergamy possible to ensure that their women have better bargaining position in the household. I once asked one woman who went into a lot of debt to give dowry to her daughter. Uh, I asked her, 
you know, why are you giving dowry? And she told me that if I don't give it, then my daughter will be made to do a lot of housework in the house. But the truth is the daughter is anyway doing a lot of housework in the house. She's pregnant right now and she's doing backbreaking labor. So, you know, what's happening there? But uh, it's something I haven't quite completely understood myself. And that's something I would like to do more work on. Yeah, Britti is asking, can the ritual of Jamai Shoshti be interpreted in a similar manner? Absolutely, spot on. Essentially, it is uh, a gift and it is a one-way gift. You know, Marcel Maus, when he wrote his book, The Gift, uh, he thought that gifts could not be one way. And when I was writing for the Rutledge edition, Gift in Economy and Society, my editor told me that, you know, you can't have one way gifts. Uh, that's not something that the literature recognizes. But dowry is a one way gift. You know, an anthropological study such as Parry, John Parry, I think his name is, uh, they understand dowry as a one way gift. And the understanding of dowry string stems from the idea of, you know, dispossession or kanyadan. I like to claim that you know, women are not a burden because of dowry. Rather, dowry arises because women are a burden in Hindu societies to start with because of the laws of Manu. It's decreed in the laws of Manu that a woman is a burden and it is the responsibility of a father to give her a gift. So because of that, uh, Jamai Shoshti, dowry, constantly trying to make the son-in-laws feel special, constant uh, you know, capitulation to the son-in-law, uh, making him feel important, making him feel cool. It, uh, that's where it stems from. It's considered one of the responsibilities of, uh, you know, of the natal home of a girl. Rethinking economics, uh, Pavitra says, isn't this compartmentalization problematic? The different forms of oppression don't exist separately from one another and they overlap with one another. Yes, absolutely right. How does econometric studies impact discussions in the policy space? Econometrics is very important in the policy space. That's the problem, you know, because the policy space is also sexist. No? They emphasize separateness and they emphasize, uh, you know, the ability to say, okay, so discrimination is happening, but what is it ha happening because of, you know? So I'm not necessarily stating that intersectionality leads to uh, econometrics or that econometrics leads itself well to intersectionality. A lot of uh, feminist scholars have critiqued discrimination studies, starting with Deb Figard. She wrote a really nice essay called uh, Gender as More Than a Dummy Variable. Uh, very, very nice article. You guys could check that out. Uh, where basically, you know, she says that we have to understand feminist economics as beyond uh, econometric studies, beyond the discrimination literature. And uh, of course, the question then becomes, how, do, how does one do that? Figard says that, you know, women's uh, feminist economists have been doing that anyway. They have been doing that by measuring the gender gap, by measuring gender gaps in leisure, by measuring uh, housework gaps, uh, and you know so on and so forth, mostly descriptive statistics. But there is a value obsession in economics which says that descriptive statistics is just descriptive statistics. And if you want to do real econom economics, then you have to do hardcore econometrics. And usually when a colleague says that, I ask very innocently as to you know how many spaces are there in social life or in personal life where hard is necessarily better than soft. Usually they don't get it, so they let me go. <laughs> and I think after a while, people don't want to argue with me. Uh, Sarika says, human capital wage equation is generally used to analyze changes in wage, absolutely, and to understand wage discrimination in the labor market. Uh, we generally see a lack of analysis of power in economics, absolutely correct. And to understand economic inequality, analysis of power is necessary. How do you suggest we bring the study of power in economics? 
depends. It depends. Uh, you tell me, Sarika, you're the, <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> we'll be we'll to see. Um, uh, you know, there is uh, Marxian analysis is a power analysis. And that's actually the strength of Marxian economics, that we are able to look at wage share, capital share, I mean, wage share versus profit share, uh, relations of how wage works, uh, you know, we can look at uh, employment and unemployment as wage and profit shares change. We can study um, what happens when there are full employment situations and what happens when there are unemployment situations. How does you know bargaining determine economic outcomes? There is economic literature on that also. For example, the Goodwin model. Right, uh, and much of the literature that stems from the Goodwin model, um, much of the studies of economic inequality are essentially interesting because they help understand power. Right, um, economics for a very long time, you know, though it has not really been understood as much, has often been about power. John Maynard Keynes, what is his major policy recommendation? It's not something that is cited very often. But in chapter 24 of general theory, he emphasizes uh, euthanizing the frontier, you know, bring all interest uh, levels down to zero so that capital becomes essentially free. And, uh, you know, it becomes less easy to uh, earn returns from capital and returns become more labor returns rather than capital returns. You know, very, very radical idea actually. You know, then you can't, uh, you know, earn wealth in the Piketty sense by sitting on top of rents or stolen capital, right? So there is there is analysis of power in economics. It's there in Keynes. It's there in Piketty. It's there in Marx. Um, feminist economics is about studying power. It's about studying the power of men. Uh, versus the power of women. So, you know, the, the, that's the kind of work that we have to do as feminist economists today. Uh, Shivanti says, even occasions like Bhai Dooj are one way gifts, absolutely. Although I haven't quite analyzed why that happens, uh, that's for you to do. Or I can think about it later, I guess. Uh, care is a feminine value, says Onnesha. Uh, it was present throughout my talk, thanks. Uh, <laughs> the value of caring is an essential support base for the flourishing of family and society. Uh, she says, dowry is institutionalized and we critique it as exploitation. I would defer uh, dowry would be critiqued as oppression, not exploitation in the Marxian sense. But it depends on which school of thought you're referring to. In many families, women naturally sacrifice a lot for male members out of care. As long ah, as long as we are labeling care as a superior value, I don't see how exploitation can be stopped. I'm not saying label care as a superior value. I'm saying that uh, take a care-centric approach to the study of economics. Basically, what is economics based on? What is the fundamental of value in economics? Uh, in classical political economy, the unit of value in economics is labor, right? Care is a type of labor, it's care labor. When you start to understand that care is labor, then you break that understanding of care as something natural. There is nothing natural about care. Women do not naturally sacrifice for male members. They sacrifice for male members because of patriarchy, because of exploitation of their care labor. So the reason why I'm emphasizing taking a care-centric approach to, uh, to economics is because uh, that would help visibilize care labor and help us understand exploitation as arising because of the exploitation of care labor, you know, and now, you know, no socialist project says that we should not do labor. 
uninsured once or twice we can go on strike but if you want to build society you have to put labor right and in every social building uh, project there is some care labor involved you know if you're building a university or building an institution somebody has to mentor younger students you know older students have to mentor younger students students who are doing better in any particular subject or any particular course have to provide support and mentorship to students who are not doing so well that's how friendship is formed that's how solidarity is formed every kind of activism is scared work you know why go door to door uh, doing activism uh, talking about uh, you know sedition talking about uapa one doesn't do it for themselves one does it out of care and that is voluntary care work you know and when that is recognized then one understands the revolutionary potential of care she says uh, labeling it as a feminine value um i think that that's exactly the point that uh, nelson is trying to make you know we have to break this dualism between rationality is equal to masculine care is equal to feminine rather if you remove the you know the sexist uh, value system which constantly emphasizes uh, exploitation over care then we are able to use care as a radical project does that make sense okay more stuff coming in ah uh, three more questions in the q and a section yeah uh concept of right price how is it featured in feminist economics ha uh, read a little bit on this um essentially it, it's in the gift economy literature and usually yeah that would be i mean some people understand it as commodification uh, some people also understand it as like i think what griber puts it as like if you like uh, griber's book um, i think it's available online it's called debt 5000 years of debt right and griber understands right price as uh, arising from human uh, economics predating capitalism usually you know when a human being goes from one place to another place then no amount of money can actually compensate that human being rather it would be like some sort of uh, you know uh, like say when you are in court right uh, the griber gives the example of the lele tribes and other kinds of african tribes he says that you know say by mistake you murder somebody right and in that case there is nothing you can do to compensate the family of the person that you've murdered and at that time the tribal courts would then say that okay so x person of x tribe has murdered y person of y tribe and now there is going to be major blood shed because everybody is angry so what can x do to ease the situation and you know remove conflict and usually they would settle through much higgling and haggling on a particular price where b would pay a certain amount of money to y it's almost like a settlement in courts so b would pay a certain amount of money to y and make the problem go away bright price is like that griber understands it through human economies uh, predating capitalism where you know x woman from x tribe goes to the y tribe now when she goes to y tribe then x tribe is left without the care and labor uh, power of that woman so x tribe has to be given some kind of compensation to ease the pain of losing their daughter or losing their family member that is how right price is understood uh, you know in in and in anthropological literature i think it's a pretty good explanation but with capitalism that same right price will then become a uh, sort of a price for the commodification of women's labor so it just changes you know depending on the regime we're in what do i think of kamal hassan's policy to pay women for their unpaid work 
I've been thinking for a while about this. And there was a really nice op-ed on it in the Hindu as well. Uh, he says, do you think it's a solution for the burdens borne by women through unpaid work? Or will it ultimately be allotted through the male member of the household? See, D Dalla Costa and James, Silvia Federici, they have been talking about wages for housework as given by the state for a while, right? And Kamal Hassan's uh, idea is basically coming from there. It's a, type, it's a kind of redistribution. And while that makes sense, uh, the question then also becomes, you know, that many other things also need to fall into place uh, for this policy to be successful. So, you know, maybe, uh, maybe one needs to, you know, also do other things. You cannot have just this policy in isolation. Rather, you need to have a proper policy framework. So that would mean wages for housework along with a national crash uh, service scheme that actually works uh, along with, uh, you know, um, say uh, rooms for breastfeeding in place of work along with, uh, you know, many other kinds of uh, um, ground policy that would have to fall into place for women to actually get their rights in society. So wages for housework is important, but it needs to, in order to be successful, it needs a broader policy framework uh, with many other aspects. Like, you know, we talk about NREGA, which is great, uh, but uh, one type of job guarantee could be a care job guarantee, where states guarantee care jobs to women to work in creches, work in daycare centers, work in nursing homes, and so on and so forth, solving the crisis of care in the economy. Right? Make sure that older people have somewhere to go where they will be taken care of. Make sure that children have somewhere to go when their moms are working. Uh, or, you know, their dads are working or their other family members are working. Until now, the family has been doing most of these tasks of care. If the state wants to uh, guarantee care through a job guarantee system, that would be a truly radical policy. So wages for housework is good, but it needs a lot more than that. Uh, Siddharth says, won't wages for housework also change how family expenditure is planned and made? money is not just paid on the existing members, absolutely correct. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, with housework is also very heavily devalued. So how would you set the wage? That's another big question, right? Uh, a lot of time use research basically sets wages at the uh, domestic wage, uh, worker wage level. And I think that is probably undervalued in most households. Um, so yeah, it's not necessarily true also that if you have wages for housework, it will be a fair wage. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done on that. Mahashweta says portrayal of housework in media often romanticizes motherhood and housework absolutely for women to realize their own economic value. Absolutely. And then it becomes a moral and a religious duty. Should we consider the labor of love as labor when workers do not see the value in their own work? And how do we bring about the realization? I think workers do understand the value in their work. You know, uh, I think most, most uh, home-based workers would probably realize that because after all, you know, when, um, you know, when they get sick or when, uh, you know, something then they, they get very worried about what will happen to the rest of the home. So they, they understand their value and they understand their importance. In fact, they do more than that. They bargain with the patriarchal powers that be in various ways. They bargain through their children. They bargain through themselves. They try to, you know, let themselves be heard. So, you know, most women do fight for their own rights. It's not necessarily a revolutionary fight. It could just be a patriarchal bargain. It, but yeah, they, they do understand that value. Now the question becomes, how do you create revolutionary policy uh, to, to, know, to resolve these patriarchal differences? 
Siddharth says, even setting aside the question of fair wage, shouldn't we apply the idea of care to how the earning members of the family spend money for people they care for? So, uh, like, you know, yeah, I guess that differs. Like, how is money spent? Um, is money spent enough on children? Is money spent enough on non-earning members? It's a question and it depends on many things. Often you'll find that earning members can make more discretionary purchases than non-earning members. Um, so, yeah, you know, usually when somebody's earning, they make more wasteful purchases than they would otherwise. So I think, you know, being able to participate in wage work does empower you. Uh, I'd still go with that uh, first wave idea. But uh, does that mean that, you know, one should not take a care-centric approach to work? And does that mean that women necessarily have to participate in wage work to be empowered? Not necessarily. The point is that, you know, if you want to be empowered, you have to do what you want, what you have to do. And you have to be able to get away with that. You shouldn't be forced to work. You shouldn't be forced to work long, back-breaking hours. You should have uh, some degree of agency over your time, like you know, temporal justice. You should feel supported. You should feel cared for. And at the same time, you should also, uh, you know, achieve all your potential as a member of society. So yeah, it depends on you know how one looks at the socialist feminist project. Uh, Dr. Rushi says, uh, wages for housework is important, but how can states intervene for redistributing unpaid care time between men and women? Various ways, like, uh, you know, one possibility, like say if you guys have read Pavlina Shedneva's work on uh, job guarantee uh, as care, that's a very nice paper, uh, try reading it. It's, I think it's freely available. Pavlina Shedneva. I'll put that on the chat. It's a difficult name to spell. Uh, Shedneva. That's the word. She is an MMT, or if you guys are familiar with that modern monetary theory. Uh, so Pavlina uh, has, you know, she argues for the job guarantee uh, through care. And I think it's a pretty phenomenal idea. I had some issues, but you know, I have issues with everything. Uh, but yeah, I think Shainava's idea is truly phenomenal, where she argues for a job guarantee in care work. And, uh, you know, that way you solve the crisis of care. And uh, through that, you also uh, ensure that, you know, people are at full employment, that labor bargaining power is increased, that wages end up going up and so on and so forth. Joseph says, do women earning members in patriarchal society have the same independence for discretionary purchase as men? That's a research question. Find out and let me know. <laughs> I will cite you, I promise. <laughs> okay, how are we doing on time? I think you guys are done. I'm also... No, wait, there's more. Okay, uh, Labisha says, uh, recently, this debate has erupted around housework being monetized and husbands should pay wives for care and give economic independence to women. Uh, yeah, wages for housework, at least through Kamal Hassan and also Stalin, in fact, uh, not Joseph Stalin, our Tamil Nadu Stalin, uh, you know, has become about paying women for housework. Uh, and usually the state will pay the bill there. Um, I think, you know, that, that I think I am, I'm a supporter of the wages for housework movement, but I don't think that by itself, it will do the job. It needs a little more. And, you know, to do a little bit more, uh, one has to basically take on a job guarantee program in care as Pavlina has written in her paper. 
uh, Shreya says, women in rural and lower sections of society, okay, still believe that it is their responsibility to do, I don't know about that, you know, that it is their responsibility to do the care work and look after others before themselves. They won't eat before the husbands have eaten. I'm again not very sure about that. <laughs> How do we empower such women? Do we have to empower such women? I think they'll empower themselves <laughs> and enter this section of society. Uh, engineers also ask for huge dowries. Uh, there you answer your own question. And education becomes source and reason for taking dowries. Exactly. All, I mean, you know, I guess if you're talking about, you know, you can't empower your sister. Uh, by sister, I mean in the political sense, like, you know, in socialist movements, you say comrade, in feminist movements, you say sister. You can't necessarily empower your sister. Your sister will empower herself. And in general, it's a collective movement. And uh, most people from all strata of society, you know, they understand the value of the work they provide. Um, we're giving them too little agency if we think that they don't understand that value. They do, and they bargain for themselves also. And, uh, you know, if, if, for instance, if you have that federal job guarantee, they would sign up for it also. Actually, you know, Jayati Ghosh has a very nice paper, which I'm very fond of, where she talks about gender and migration. And she actually shows empirically that women's work is actually more stable than men's work. And you might be able to find, I'm not entirely sure, I have catch hold of CPHS data, which I don't have because it costs 11 lakh rupees. But uh, if you really want to find out, you might be able to find that women's work over the pandemic might have been more stable than men's work on average. Although, you know, pressures on women to withdraw from the job market will also be more. So it depends. It depends on, you know, on how the uh, statistics look, we'll have to find out. Uh, catch hold of, does DNU have CPHS data? No, right? No. Uh, yeah, we'll go to find. Or maybe if they produce another time use survey, then we'll find out. But that is, that's an empirical question. Uh, Dr. Ushi is saying, provide some insights on the burden of unpaid care as a cause of time poverty. Um, you know, if you, if you just look at uh, time use statistics, and you can look at any country, uh, the US time use statistics is freely available and you can just download it. And you'll be able to find, uh, one of my students did a, a hypothesis, she was doing hypothesis testing. So she found the average uh, time spent in leisure by men and the average time spent in leisure by women. And uh, she couldn't see much difference. Also, it's American stats and time use, the differences don't show up. But she did a test of significance. T value was at least 12. A very high, very high difference between the average time that men have for leisure and the average time that women have for leisure. And you know, you guys can do it yourself as part of your statistics project. Just uh, download the you know 2020. Uh, American time use data, so, uh, use data or use R, whatever you want. You don't really need data because the data is already extracted. It will be in a CSV folder. You can use R if you want. Find the average of men's leisure time, find the average of women's leisure time, take the difference, find the standard deviation, pooled, same population, uh, find the T statistic, and see if it's significant, it will be. That, you know, so that means women have significantly less leisure than men have, which means significantly less time to recuperate their energies, to replenish themselves, to read a book, to, uh, you know, think, uh, you know, and, and that causes a lot of trouble that causes problems in relationships. Um, I'm always annoyed with my husband because he's always playing video games and I'm stuck all the time, <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah, that, that causes a lot of tension. So that, that's where your time poverty comes from. 
uh, if you consider, um, you know, um, one of my friends, uh, she takes care of my son for me uh, when I'm working here. Her day starts at 3 a.m. She gets up. Until recently, what she was doing was making, uh, you know, the gober cakes that are used to cool the houses. So she would be up at 3 a.m. She would make tea and breakfast. Then she would uh, make the gober cakes. And that was because she paid dowry for her daughter. And, uh, you know, uh, after paying dowry for her daughter, uh, she then... Uh, went into debt and then she had to make these gober cakes. Then she gets her son ready for school or his online classes nowadays, which she's taking through a phone, uh, which she's also in debt for. And then she comes here uh, and she's here till about 6.30 or so while I'm taking my lectures, doing my classes. Goes back and, you know, we ask her in a friendly way, what are you going to do when you get home? She has to make dinner. She can't afford gas. Well, I try to help her of buy a gas uh, cylinder, but she refuses uh, because she says that it's too expensive and she doesn't want to spend money on a gas cylinder. So then it is a chulha, which means it takes her even more time. And she's sitting in front of a chulha for hours. And then she's in bed by around 10, up at 3 a.m. the next day. There is very little time to learn new skills, uh, to improve her savings, to um, recuperate her energies or do anything else. And, you know, I tell her, don't show up to work on Sunday, you're not needed. But she wants to come over because, you know, she often feels that being at her workplace gives her more leisure, in fact, than being at home. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's your time poverty. I don't know. How, well, I know how to calculate that, but that would be a project. Hey, that's what we can do with time use data when it comes out. Uh, I hope some of you do that. Uh, we have missed a couple of questions uh, by Siddharth and uh, Dr. Rishi in the chat box. Oh, where? Where am I? Uh, chat box. Where is this chat box? Uh, uh, Dr. Shiga, I just did that. Dr. Uh, Shiga no, taking... It's the previous one. Um, Dr. Oh. Shiga was asking, although wages for housework is important for recognizing women's unpaid care, care bur burden, how can states mm -hmm. intervene for redistributing unpaid care time between men and women? Uh, uh, that was uh, through the... Uh, that's why I was talking about Pavlina Shadnava's work, through the job guarantee uh, for care. That, that's how I would uh, see it. You know, so if you have job guarantee for care uh, that raises wages, um, it uh, as you have an increase in wages, you have increased wage share, increased bargaining power for work, increased bargaining power of women in their homes, um, you know, less time poverty. So that would, um, I, I think that would take care of some of the problem. At least that's how I would. I think I'm done. Oh, wait, there's one here. Uh, women may pay more taxes than men for health and hygiene products yeah. uh -huh. uh, related to mental health or grooming products like razors. Uh, the pink tax, yes. How do we help the governments to be fair to women for their basic needs? Yeah, I think menstrual products are a very, very big issue in body politics today. You know, at least while I was doing activism in JNU, uh, there was uh, body politics was considered a bad thing, at least in activist circles. Today, it is considered to be, you know, one of the major spaces where it's very important to, you know, do activism around and uh, menstrual hygiene and men and you know access to menstrual care products. Uh, is a very major part of the of that movement. There was, I think, pads against sexism after I left JNU, right? You guys know more about this than I do. Uh, what other movements were there? So yeah, you know, movements like that, the student movements, um, women's movements to uh, get better access to basic health care. That's very essential. Also, you know, uh, 
birth control, right? Uh, so that while we can control our uh, reproductive cycles. Um, so sorry, I got a bit of a shock from the electric cable. Uh, so, you know, the taxes on birth control pills uh, so that we can take care of, we can get control over our uh, reproductive cycles designs of uh, condoms that women can uh, you know have control over rather than depend on men to have control over them uh, that, that that's very essential uh, i guess we are done with the questions yeah i'm surprised yeah. we are done that was quite a lot <laughs> that, 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 that was amazing guys thank you for having me and thank you for your wonderful <laughs> We really want to thank you for like taking time off your out of your busy schedule and just we had a talk for about two hours and it was highly interactive and we had like good bunch of questions also. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we will look through the readings definitely and you have suggested a lot more uh, new uh, references also. So we are thinking to come up with this uh, read or uh, take up these readings in a different reading circle session which is much more student led and we can discuss all these readings in much more detail. So if anyone wants to take part in those reading circle sessions, please reach out to us over mail or any of our other social media handles. And also, uh, if you have any specific feedback with respect to this session or uh, you want, if you want us to take up any activity specifically, you can al always reach out to us in any of the social media handles. And yeah, um, thank you everyone like for attending this webinar and um, have a be safe and take care of your family and everyone else. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.